Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, I think we'll just pray before we start. Uh, Lord, thank you for everybody here this morning. Um, thank you that we could be together here free to worship. Um, but I just ask now, Lord, that you speak to each and every one of us um, through your word. I pray that that word will just feed us and encourage us and uh, just help us for the week ahead, Lord. So we just thank you for all those at home, uh, for those watching, for those struggling. And we just pray that they know your comfort and your blessing too. Amen. Now, if you look on the screen, you'll see a third. From the World War II battleship Yamato. It was equipped with the largest guns and the heaviest armor of any ship. It fired shells weighing over a ton. And the turret alone weighed an incredible 2,774 tons. That was more than the weight of most ships at the time. It's pretty heavy, but it's not near as heavy as what I'll be talking about for the next few minutes. And this is my idea of giving you a fair warning. <laughs> so. And there was a reason I was drawn to this particular passage, which I'll share in a minute. Uh, for my whole life, I've never been able to witness suffering without a break in my heart. It might sound like a good, healthy reaction, but it became disabling in the face of so much pain in the world, um, a prison of sorts. I couldn't even walk on grass, and that's the truth, without the thought of my footsteps killing something, uh, no matter how small that life was. It was a kind of pity and sorrow for all living things, uh, from insects and animals to people. But what do you do with that? What do you do when the whole world is suffering and you can't turn it off? You can't make it stop. Well, since the outbreak of the war in the Middle East, I found myself overwhelmed again by the suffering I was witnessing. And looking at the millions of people protesting around the world, I know I'm not alone in that. Uh, the world is a very dark place. When Facebook first came out, there was little in the way of filters to screen what you saw on your feed. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers that, but if, like me, you were unfortunate enough to see pictures and videos of what people do to animals, then you know it can't be forgotten. Uh, those memories disturb me to the core. Like they actually make me feel physically ill. Uh, what people do to other people is far worse. A former Facebook moderator, one of these poor people that has to view all these uploaded videos, uh, reported that they go through up to 100 videos a day. She recalled the graphic violence the child abuse, abuse, the exploitation, and the horror, saying that it haunted her waking moments in her sleep. As she couldn't turn it off. Post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression rates are high among moderators. Uh, she expects to be on psychiatric medication for the rest of her life because of it. Many moderators turn to drugs and alcohol, which is tragic, but understandable. The human mind can only take so much. We develop ways of protecting ourselves by just blocking it all out. And to look on the world as it is, to see the truth of it invites trauma and pain and the realization that we're not in control. Now I know that's heavy subject matter for a Sunday morning and if you feel your mind building up barriers to it, then join the club. It's uncomfortable, it's it's unsettling, and unfortunately it's the reality of our world. It's a reality that I was deeply struggling with. And that's when this passage, that just kept popping up everywhere. And I'm going to share it with you now. Today we are going to be reading Matthew 5, 13 to 16, which is found near the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The big question I needed answering was this though, and this is what I wanted to get across, was how should we as Christians respond to the overwhelming darkness in the world? As we'll see, the world is not without hope. For one far greater has overcome the darkness. And going through today's passage, I also found something that I didn't expect to find. Something really unexpected. Joy. So today's passage, 
uh, Caroline is going to be reading. Um, thanks, Caroline. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, a little background and context first. Um, if you turn to your Bible, you'll see your passage sits right in the middle of what's known as the teaching or Sermon on the Mount. If you're not familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, a large crowd had been following Jesus, some to be healed, some to see miracles, and some to listen to his teaching. And it was during his teaching on the hill, Jesus turned and addressed his disciples, and he began to teach them about the upside down kingdom of God. Upside down because it was the opposite to the way the people of the world lived and thought. The least were the greatest, the greatest the least. He spoke of how a follower of his would live in stark contrast to the world and about the cost of following him. He spoke of having gentleness and mercy, of being a peacemaker, uh, qualities that are the opposite of the world around us. He spoke about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that in heaven they would have it. Blessed were those who mourn, blessed were those that were insulted, persecuted and rejected on account of his name, for great was their reward in heaven. It was in the middle of this teaching that Jesus told his disciples to be salt and light in the world. And he tells us the same, but what does it mean? Uh, this is what I want to focus on. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Now, when I first read that, I kind of smiled because I was thinking to myself that maybe in this modern era, salt has gained a bit of a bad reputation. And um, the meaning may seem a bit cryptic in today's world. For one, you are the salt of the earth doesn't mean the Christians today are tasked with the job of raising people's blood pressure and making the middle. Um, salt of the earth was instead a description more familiar to people back in Jesus' day. But how was it meant? So several ideas have been proposed, and they're all valid. Um, salt we know is a preservative. It slows rot. And slow and rotten decay when applied to meat and other foods, it would have definitely been important in the days before refrigeration. So there's definitely an aspect of Christians being sprinkled on the earth to slow the decay and hold back the rotten society. A force for good wherever God scatters us. Then there's salt, the flavor enhancer. Remind me not to put the writing in yellow. You. Um, yeah, there's an element here of the gospel appealing to those around us. I mean, salt makes food taste better. Um, out of love, we want people to know the goodness of Jesus. We want people to hear the gospel and be saved. So we choose our words carefully. It doesn't mean watering down the gospel or avoiding the hard bits, but it does mean using wisdom and discernment in our conversations. In Colossians 4 6, Paul tells his believers to let our conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that we may know how to answer everyone. Now, it might seem strange that a Christian would have any connection to judgment. Um, but in Scripture, we find the use of salt. Um, it was a sign of judgment, because in Judges 9.45 it says that all day Abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he captured it and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered salt over it. So it was a sign of judgment. How could that be for us? Uh, well, we read in Philippians a few weeks ago that the unity and courage of the church in the face of persecution, it was a sign of judgment to those persecuting them. And the hope being that those persecuting would repent upon realizing that the believer's unity and courage was from God. We see that theme again soon when we look at light. 
Next one is sacrifice. Salt was also used in sacrifice to God at the temple. And if we read Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we see that we are living sacrifices. And this also ties in. So, so far we have salt for preserving, salt for flavoring, for sacrificing, and for judgment. The disciples would have known all these. They would have been familiar to them. Um, The next part of verse 13 sounds a bit like a warning. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now, if your brain works like mine, then you read that and worry about losing salvation. That's not what it means. The Bible is very clear that once we're saved, nothing can snatch us from God's hand. We're his. And I just want to make that as clear as possible. What Jesus is doing here is he's making a point. What good is it to anyone if we don't live out who God has made us to be? I mean, salt's purpose is to be salt. Proper salt, it never loses its saltiness. It's a remarkably stable compound. It'll last forever if stored right. But there are a couple of ways it can lose its flavor, its saltiness. And the main way is if it gets watered down too much, or if too much dirt gets into it. It's a clear picture of what happens in our Christian lives when we allow the world to water us down. When we say we follow Jesus, but the reality is we get up in the morning and we follow ourselves and do what we want. Then we don't live in the reality of who God has made us to be. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. That we need to live out who we are as his followers in society. Now light, light to me is more understandable than salt. Um, because you have light, you have darkness. And in contrast to light, we have a picture of a world and its people in complete darkness. A world of sin, and evil under the dominion of the devil, uh, where the God himself is worshipped and served. It's a place of fear where men do evil as they please. It's people reject and rage at God. Everything is tainted with pain and death. The evil that men do is so vile that we can't even look at it or speak of it. It's people, well, hell is the end destination for its inhabitants. They live without meaning, without hope. It is darkness. It's a world that needs light. A world that needs Jesus. John 8, 12. Of himself, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 12, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. John 1 tells us that in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The world is dark. Jesus is the light. Like a lighthouse over a dark land, he drew us to him, and when we trusted in him, Trusted in his sacrifice on the cross to pay for our sins was enough. He saved us. And now he tells us, in verse 14, that we are the light of the world. Now, it's not because we're good people. It's not the case. I mean, we're sinners the same as everyone. We're all the same. But it is because Jesus forgave our sins and that we have a new relationship with him. It's the light of Jesus shining through us as he changes us and helps us to draw closer to him. He's changing us to be like him, giving us the desire to serve him and each other out of love. And it's all him. Light is who we are. 
It's our identity and our purpose combined. We want to pass on the light of the gospel and the light and love of Christ to everyone. We desire to live it out in word and deed and in every possible way as an expression of our love for Jesus. And we're talking about real love in action here. Um, love not based on how we feel or whether we like someone or not. It's not like the Pharisees who did it for show um, so that they could be praised. I mean, this is a gift from God. It's his power at work in us and through us and it leads to God being praised. In a reading, Jesus says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a ball. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, earlier... I asked the question, how should we as Christians respond to the overwhelming darkness in the world? The world and the hearts of men are full of evil and darkness, and this is true. Only Jesus can fix it. Yet he tells us that we're the light of the world, his light. And the darker it gets, the more light is needed. And that was the answer in part. We are needed in this world. God has given a mission for each and every person here. Every day we wake up to be salt and light. Ephesians 2.10 For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works for which God prepared in advance for us to do. The closer that we stick to Jesus, the more we see what these works are because we're seeing through the eyes of love. By far the most loving thing we could do to anyone is to share the gospel with them. We know that, but it's not the only thing and the only way that we can love others. Uh, There are people in our lives that only we can reach. Opportunities to love and share the gospel that only we can do. The right person in the right place at the right time. That's what God does. A text, a phone call, Prayer or encouragement for someone that needs it. Standing with the persecuted. Sitting with the suffering. God takes the very little that we offer and magnifies it beyond anything we can imagine. It's his power at work. He knows our struggles, the times that we can't get out of bed, the times we don't want to, the times we wonder how we can be anyone's light because all we see is dark. The truth is we need light and love and grace just as much as the next person. Jesus says we are the light of the world, even if we don't feel it. And the Bible is full of ordinary people like us, with limitations and struggles and weaknesses. But our struggles and weaknesses are just opportunities for God to display his power even more. It's not easy being salt and light in a dark world. And there is a cost. Christians the world over are persecuted and killed every day, hated for who they are and what they represent because light brings judgment on darkness by its very nature. there and this this is judgment this is John 3.19 this is judgment light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed Um, I also mentioned earlier that this passage brought me joy when I didn't expect it and I'd like to end on that and share the encouragement it gave me The question I started with was, how should we as Christians respond to the overwhelming darkness in the world? And the answer I got had more in it than I was expecting. Um, 
this call to be salt and light. It seemed to be telling me to fight evil by doing good. And I can relate to that. But there was something far more. You see, our call to love others and share the gospel, to be children of God in this world, it comes from our relationship with Jesus. And it flows from it. And that's what hit me. Because in the middle of it all, I'd gotten so focused on the darkness that I forgot to look to my own light. Uh, Jesus. Then I remembered that I trust him with all things, even the things I don't understand, even the world I can't fix. And that's what brought me joy. And it's simple. I know that. But it was the answer that I needed. And I thank God for it. Our trusting relationship with Jesus is the key to being salt and light in the world. The key to dealing with overwhelming darkness. There's real joy in our relationship with him and in living it out. Joy in being who God made us to be and letting Jesus shine through us. It's a real joy. Joy in watching God do what God does best and being a part of it. So Jesus is our focus. As our center, let's be salt and light in the world. And um, I don't think it's in the slides. What oh, is? We have it. But Paul's words in Ephesians, um, they just seem really fitting to end on. It's Ephesians 5 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Amen.